Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Oh, come on. How are we doing this morning? Good. Isn't this just a great day to be in the house of God? Yes. I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm anticipating God doing something amazing this morning. I, you know, I'm anticipating God just doing something really amazing. I think we got it. So now I'm going to do the announcements so I can catch my breath before I start singing. Good morning, church. I got one? <laughs> Come on. Good morning. We are going to try this again. Good morning, family. Good morning. Listen, I've been doing this over a year. Come on. No, I'm just kidding, you guys. Boy, I'm excited to be here this morning. I'm excited for what God is doing here. So... I'm going to shift things a little bit because I like to do that. Instead of starting with worship, I actually want to start with our announcements. And the reason why I'm doing that is because when we get into deep spirit-filled worship, and then we break it up with announcements, I kind of feel like we, we lose our focus. And then we have to get our focus back when we start preaching on the word of God. What I want to do is I want to give God the full attention the whole time. So I wanted to do the announcements first. So here's what we got going on in our family this week. Rachel, you can come. So as you guys know, we had a business meeting at the Mercy Point Church in Watertown. And we are glad to say that we have, I don't, I call him a CEO. I'm not sure what to call him. He's our new, our, our new lead pastor. Our new lead pastor for Mercy Point. For the network. Point, for the network for Mercy Point Ministries is Pastor Donnie McGrew from our Pulaski campus, Grace Point Church in Pulaski. So that means nothing's changing. We are still a unified body. We are still a family. Pastor Johnny McGrew is just now the one who is going to be overseeing all of the operations. He's just the one that gets to make all the decisions. Yes. <laughs> and it was an awesome meeting. It was unanimous. We all agreed. Donnie's going to do some amazing things. He's got a passionate heart for Christ. For like, he inspires me. Him and his wife inspire me and Sean a lot. And so I'm excited to see what's going to happen with that. The next one, this Halloween, I about said December. Guys, I'm a Christmas person. <laughs> October 31st is our House of Lights celebration. I wanted to go into a little bit of detail about what House of Lights is. So as we know, this church has been famous for doing trunk or treat for several years, and it's been a huge success every year. Well, there's a trunk or treat going to happen a week before, right at the fairgrounds, which our church is going to be representing. On It's going to be on the uh, 25th from, we're going to set up at about 4, 15, 4, 30, but it's going to be from 5 to 8. We encourage you guys, if you want to come hang out with us, Absolutely. We are just doing a separate thing where we can try to get into the community as much as we can. Because ministry is great, but you got to get outside the four walls. So that's exactly what we're doing. So on the 25th of this month, it is a Friday, over here at the fairgrounds, they are having a trunk or treat celebration. Our church is going to be there. Rachel and I have been working very hard on what we feel will reach the kids. 
so we picked, if, for those of you who have children, we picked a Minecraft theme. For those of you that don't know what Minecraft is, it is an extremely addicting game that kids love to play on computers, on phones, on tablets, on like PlayStations. It's everywhere. But every kid that sees it immediately recognizes it. So we are going to be doing, me and Rachel, our kids ministry leader, we're going to be doing something fun with that. Because when we go and do things, we do things big. Amen. But we really don't need anything for that. What I need your guys' help with is the thing that our church is going to be doing solely on our own, which is House of Lights. House of Lights is different than Trunk or Treat. House of Lights, instead of being several different cars trying to do their own three themes, trying to do, like, each car try to have their own candy, our big thing is family. And families do things together. I'm so... What we decided is that we're going to do one big thing for Halloween. House of Lights, we are going to set up at Miss Jeannie's location. Um, we will get the address out starting next week. We are going to come together, and we are just going to be lights to the community. We offer hot chocolate and coffee for the parents and the kids to stay warm. We're going to give them bags of candy that let them know, hey, we're a fun church. Our church is right here on Rock Island Street. We're going to have games. We are going, it's just a time that we as a community, as a family, can reach out to those and see that we're just like them. Because that's more important to me instead of trying to set up all these vehicles and not really having the chance to build a personal relationship with people. But I need your guys' help. The one thing that we need most importantly is I need candy donations. Some of you have already donated. Believe me, thank you. But if you can't donate candy, I also need cups or chocolate. I need hot chocolate. A lot of the times we will make little baked goods if the parents want some baked goods. However God leads you to help, that is beautiful. And I appreciate that. Let me know. I will have a list on our probably next week, or actually I'll get it up this Wednesday, of what we need as a church to make this successful for our, for our event. If you have any questions, come see me after church. Or if you want to boogie out of here real quick, you can always call, text, or Facebook message me. And finally, this Friday... I have been talking this up because you ladies know how to cook. This Friday is going to be our very first ladies' dinner club. It is here at the church. It starts at 6 p.m. It is a Italian potluck. I want you, for the ladies who are going to come, I want you guys to bring your favorite Italian dishes. I've heard some people saying they're going to bring ziti. I've heard some lasagnas. I've heard some really fancy pasta salad that I can't pronounce the name. Sandy knows what I'm talking about. It is a time, what is it? Antipasta salad. Antipasta salad. Okay, maybe that's not fancy, but I can't remember things. Ladies, this is an opportunity for us just to get together and just hang. Just hang out, be family, I'm going to be talking about the direction that our min women's ministry is going to be going. But really, it's just a time to have fun. And what better way to have fun than with a ton of carbohydrates in our body? Amen? I will not be keto that day. All right. And one more announcement, finally, is um, we will start being having a printed out calendar of all of our events and announcements so that we can spend our Sunday mornings getting God to God quickly because our first love should be God and there are days I just want to run to him like this morning I just want to run to God and I just want to tell him thank you God thank you that we are getting ready to do some pretty awesome things and it's by his grace not our own so church I'm going to open up with prayer and when we get into worship today, I don't want you to worry about the things that are going on in your life. 
I don't want you to worry about the stresses and struggles that have been happening through the week. Because God already knows them. What I want today is I want to show our younger generation what it means to truly worship. To give up everything just like Christ gave up everything. Worship is more than a song. I say it all the time. Worship is a lifestyle. We should always be worshiping the name of Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be in a set for song in a church morning. Worship is waking up in the morning and praising God for that beginning breath. Worship is in the middle of the day when you are sitting at your job trying to figure out numbers or trying to figure out what you're doing and worship is saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for this moment. Worship is when you're at night with your family, watching them, relaxing with them and going, thank you, Jesus, for the gifts that you've given my children, the gifts you have given my spouses, the gifts you have given me. Worship is at night when God gives visions and dreams. When God brings peace and restoration when there hasn't been for long times. So Heavenly Father, I come to you right now, Lord Jesus. I just pray. I just pray a prayer of thanksgiving. God, I just thank you. I just thank you that what you are doing in our lives right now is exactly what you determined it to be that you have destiny for us, that you have purpose for us, most importantly, that you love us. So God, we come to you right now in complete surrenderance, letting go of everything we know and just sitting in your presence, singing the praises of your name. These things we pray in your name.
Lord, just come into this place today. God, we invite your presence in this morning, Lord Jesus. We invite you into this place, Lord Jesus.
to him, church. you here. 
would you agree this morning there is no place that you would rather be than in the presence of our Savior? There is no place I would rather be than in the presence of my King. Lord Jesus, we just want to be in your presence this morning.
want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you. Lord, we desire more of you. Lord, we thirst for more of you. that a lot and it may not make sense but when we normally don't break through it's because we're holding back we're holding back maybe feelings we have maybe we've just had a rough week maybe we got a doctor's report we didn't want to hear maybe we looked at our pocketbooks and we realized that there wasn't enough money to do the things we needed to do to survive Maybe we lost a friendship today. Maybe sometime this week we just got offended. And we've been holding on to that offense day after day after day after day. Why would they do that? Why would they hurt my feelings? Maybe we just got overwhelmed with life. Maybe our children just overwhelmed us this week. Why did they make those decisions? as we try to sing worship, as we try to praise God, in the back of our mind, these thoughts are still racing and racing and racing. When we say complete surrender, it that means we take those thoughts captive and we say, God, I'm dropping it at the altar because I don't understand. Or God, I'm angry. Or God, I'm scared. Or God, I'm hurt. God is saying, I'm right here. Let me take those problems for you. I didn't die on the cross so you can carry them. My spirit is so much more than you're letting it be. You're containing me in a little tiny box. I want to give you it all, God. Before we go into this next song, if those thoughts are racing through your mind, if you're mad, if you're angry, if you're scared, if you're frustrated, if you're offended, you need to get to the altars and say, God, I don't want this. I don't want to waste that energy anymore. When I get to be spending that energy and that time serving and praising the one true king, church we're gonna do that again because I feel it God is saying you're holding on to something and I'm hearing offense you're holding on to offense you're holding on to fear you're holding on to anger you're letting a doctor speak death over you and we know there is life in our king stop listening to the world they don't know squat my God is omnipresent. He is perfect. He is omnipotent. He is the true coming king. He is an Alpha and Omega for a reason. He is Alpha Omega, period. It's time to us to let go and let God. No place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. Here in your love, here in your love, no place I would rather. 
rather be. It's no place I would rather be. It's no place I would rather be. Here in your love, here in your love. It's no place I would rather be. It's no place I would rather be. It's no place I would rather be. Here in your love, here in your love, so set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God, we wait on you this morning. We wait for you, God. you are having an encounter with God, I want you to stay right where you're at. You ain't got to move. We are going to move forward with the service, though. If I could get the ushers to come at this time, we are going to get ready to take the morning tithes and the offerings. How many believe somebody how many believe that God is moving in this church? How many believe uh, come on, how many believe that God is moving in this church? Oh, come on now. God is moving. God is doing something. Despise not the day of small beginnings. 
despise not the day of small beginnings because God has called us to do something pretty phenomenal here in the North Country. But at this time, we're going to take up our morning tithes and offerings. So God, I just pray right now, God, that you bless this offering. God, that you bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As they wait, God has been just messing us up on Wednesday nights. Um, can I get it? Can somebody say amen to that? God has been just messing us up on Wednesday nights. Um, and, and, you know, the idea of Wednesday night right now is that we're just coming in here without an agenda, without a plan, really, and just kind of letting God do what he wants to do. Um, and out of Wednesday nights, we have started to get God's beginning to speak. And earlier in the week, God woke me up. That was actually the second, 10 2. I wrote a date on it. I've been writing dates so I can get, I don't get things confused because I can say yesterday, and it happened yesterday or a couple days ago, and it was six months. Um, anybody, anybody else have that problem? Yeah, just the other day. And it was like, no, no, Sean, that was January of last year. Oh, okay. Well, it seemed like yesterday. And I, I've, I, I've begun to deal with the issue of where are we going? You know, the Bible clearly tells us that without a vision, the people perish. Without, without somebody saying, hey, this is where we're going, then we can tend to kind of just do whatever we want to do. Amen? And so God's really been kind of de dealing with me about a lot of things, actually, and I don't know if anybody else can can bear witness to that, but God is really, God has been dealing with me on areas, things, and I believe he's dealing with all of us on areas and things. But I woke up, and, and in, my, in my morning prayer and devotion time, I, 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 wrote, I wrote this, because I believe this is where God's calling us. I don't know if any, many of you saw on, on, on our Facebook page, I changed the cover photo, and it says, a fall to remember. Now, a fall to remember. We are in fall, unfortunately, it is that time of year again, which fall around here sometimes means winter. <laughs> we had about, we had a, we had a fall of a couple, of, of a couple, couple weeks there, maybe, who knows. But I just want to read to you what I wrote. That's how I want to start this, this morning. And it says this. It says, I believe, this is me speaking, I believe that God is calling this assembly to come back to the place of first love. Over the next fall, October to December, October to December, God is calling us to stoke the flames of personal devotion in our hearts, bringing us back to the place where we live burning, for the things of God. God will begin to tear down strongholds in the life of the believer. And I believe he is already doing that in a lot of us. I know he's doing that in me. Things that I have held on to for years. God is beginning to tear down the strongholds. God is going to release the pain that has been locked up deep down. God is going to, this is, this is all I should be prefaced with, I believe. Let me rephrase that, okay? I believe that God is going to reveal the true motive of the heart. And it is our place to repent for the wrong, motiva wrong motivations and begin to seek him for the godly motivations. I believe that's where God's calling us. For the next, what if we took the next three months, the next 90 days, and said, God, I just want to know your presence. I, I want to know you like I knew you when I first got saved. I want to know you like I knew you. Because I don't know about you, but am, am, I, I, I'm, I'm going to speak for myself for a minute. I've let other things come in and distract me from what God's actually called me to be. I've let the world come in and, and suck my attention. And the Bible tells us that 
where there are two visions, the people perish. Where there is division, division, meaning two. Meaning we have to have our eyes solely focused on one thing. We, we, we will either love the world and hate Jesus, or we're going to love Jesus and hate the world. There is no, there's no other way around it. There's no, other, there's no other way to do it. We have to have singular vision. And our vision must be being at the feet of Jesus. Our vision must be coming back to the place of first love. So for those of you that are there or there on Wednesday night, this is probably going to sound a little familiar, but I believe it's something that the whole body needs. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. The book of Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to start by reading verses 1 through 7. Revelation chapter 2, and my, the letter to Ephesus. We know there are seven churches that he wrote to. And we're going to talk about the first one this morning. It says, write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. Notice that. He says, I know your works, your labor, your endurance, that you cannot tolerate evil people. Jesus is telling them, he says, listen, you're doing good works. You're doing the right things. And he goes on to say, you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. God, I pray right now. Lead me by your spirit this morning. Let me say nothing that is not from you. Let me say nothing that is not for your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In this text, we see that there are four things that God likes that they're doing. Their works, their labor, their endurance, and they do not tolerate evil people. They do not tolerate corruption from the pulpit. They do not tolerate people coming in and sowing seeds of discord. They do not tolerate them. But he goes on to say, the thing I have against you is that you've left your first love. You see, I, I believe that this church was a church that had the structure, had the how down. They had the greeters in place. They had plenty of kids workers. They had everything set, and they were functioning, and they were doing it, and they were winning people to Jesus, and they were coming in. They were going out. They were doing daily life, and they, they were coming to church on Sunday mornings. They were coming to church on Wednesday nights. They were doing it, but they forgot where they came from. They forgot where they came from. And, and they got caught up in the mechanics of doing it. How often do we do that? How often have, I've started a few new jobs in my life, and how often do you, those of you that are supervisors or those, that have you, those of you that have started new jobs, do you start off really well? Everybody's motivated. I got a new job, and it's exciting. 
and I show up early and I punch in and now there's probably a few that don't do. I'm sure brother, I, I know brother Mark's got a few stories, I'm sure, about people that just can't show up on time, about people that just are unmotivated. But you see, that wasn't the problem at the church. But how often do we do that? Over a course of time, over a period of time, things become routine. How often in our marriages, in our relationships, do things become routine? Becomes the same old, same old, day in and day out. We know, we get up, we see each other, we go to work, we come home, we eat dinner, we go to sleep, it becomes routine. It becomes day in and day out. And then we begin to take, and then what happens is, we begin to take for granted those things that, that, that have been given to us. We take for granted our spouse. We take for granted the job. The job that was first a blessing now becomes a struggle. The spouse that at first was a blessing now becomes, now we start looking at them sideways and going, what did I do? Those things that we thought were awesome at first now then become work. They become a struggle. It becomes, we know how to do it. We know how to be married. And so we just do it. We get up. And I make the coffee. My wife will get up and she'll make the coffee for, in the mor for me in the morning. But what's the motivation? We get up and we, we do the laundry. But what's the motivation? We get up and we do the things of being married. But what's the motivation? And that's what God, I believe God's asking this church. I believe that's what God would ask us this morning. What's your why? Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we serve? Why do we come to church? Why? Is it because it's what we've always done? Do we come to church because it's something that we do? Is it because, it, because we're American Christians and that's what we do on Sunday mornings from 1030 to 12 and we just come to church? Is that it? What's our motivation in it? And God is asking this church, he's telling them, he says, listen, you do the works really well. You labor. You've endured hardship. You've, you've come under persecution and you've endured it and you've come out on top. You, you believe the word of God. You believe my promises. You, you are following the word. You're doing it all right, except you don't love me like you did, like you loved me when you first loved me. You see, the, Jesus tells us in the Gospels, he says, listen, on the day of judgment, there are people that are going to come before me and say, did I not cast out devils in your name? Did I not heal people in your name? Did him, if our love for him is not the first love, if he is not the central focal point of our lives, then scripture's clear. The Bible says, take up your cross and follow me. What was the cross? The cross is the instrument that I use to crucify my flesh. 
The cross is the instrument that we use to destroy the works of the flesh and accept the works of the Spirit. Because if I don't take up my cross, and if I don't follow in the footsteps of Jesus, laying my life down, counting it as loss, and then I have no part of him. And you're saying, Sean, that's a, Pastor, that's, that's really brutal. Where's the love of God in that? But the love of God is that he gave his life. He gave his life as a ransom for many. And we have to be willing to sacrifice on the other end. We have to be willing to make Jesus Christ our central focal point, sitting at the feet of Jesus, our central focal point, not winning the world. Is that, is that a great, is that a great cause? Absolutely, that is a great cause. Not seeing abortion ended in America, is that a great cause? That is absolutely a great cause. But I have known a lot of people that have championed causes without knowing Christ. And at the end of the, whatever they get accomplished, they're still empty. They Now they have to find another cause. But if we find the feet of Jesus and we go back to a passionate, burning, first love with him, then out of that, we become burdened with the things of God. Am I saying that abortion needs to be ended in America? Absolutely. Make no mistake about it. Yes, it does. Am I saying that People need to know of the gospel and the love of Jesus. And we need to win this country. And we need to win this county. And we need to win this city for Jesus. I am absolutely 100% declaring that that needs to be done. But we can win the city and still end up in a devil's hell. Because we didn't know him. We didn't know Jesus, because we did it out of wrong motivations, because we did it not for him, because we did it without loving him the way that we need to. But he gives us the answer in verse 4. He says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. But in verse 5, is the remedy. Because how many know God does not give a problem without giving the remedy? Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Does anybody remember how on fire and passionate you were about Jesus when you first got saved? Does anybody remember how passionate you were about courting your spouse when you first got married? So I don't know about you, but when I first started dating this beautiful, lovely young lady, I would stay up until all hours of the night, even though I had to be up early in the morning to go to PT. I'd stay up and we'd talk on the phone for three hours. Anybody, listen, if anybody's never been here, I'm calling you, telling you right now, you're a liar. How many people would remember sitting up on the phone going, what are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing? I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just, I love you. Anybody ever remember that time? Anybody ever remember that time with your spouse? Or, 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 you know, and you just, and, and nothing matters. It doesn't matter how, you could spend three hours on the phone talking about absolutely nothing, but the fact that you're on the phone together meant the world. Now, after marriage, being married of five years, I come in, and she's like, how was work? That's fine. How was work? Great. And we go in our separate things, and we do our separate, right? What God is to hope. Right? Right? We kind of just, you know, we ignore each other. 
I call her, I call her on the phone now, and she's like, I don't like talking on the phone. And I'm like, but, but, but I, remember, I remember years ago whenever we could talk on the phone for hours. And she says, yeah, but that's because I was 1,200 miles away from you. Well, you know, that's the only communication we had. But how many of it, how, how often is that like our relationship with Christ? Remember back to when we first fell in love. Remember back to when we were first saved, when getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to read your Bible and pray before going to work wasn't a chore. Remember when turning off, turning off the television at night and just meditating on the things of God wasn't, wasn't a problem. It wasn't a chore. Remember when. And he says, remember it. Look back on it. And remember and then repent. What does repent mean? I, I, listen, if, if, we don't, if we don't understand one thing in this church that I've taught over the last year, we should understand repentance. Change the way we think. Metanoia. Change the way we think about it. Turn from it and change the way we think. The Bible talks about renewing it, giving us the mind of Christ, renewing our minds. And that's an interesting subject we're going to go in here in a little while, here in a couple weeks, talking about renewal. Renewing our minds, renewing ourselves, and that's what we have to do in the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit brings these things up, we have to renew our minds. We have to get our minds focused on what He has said. Stop thinking the the way of the flesh. Stop thinking the way of the world. Stop thinking about how you know. Yeah, it's fine. Everybody sits at home. Everybody sits at home at nights and watch t- and watches TV. And why am I picking on TV? Because it's a low hanging fruit right now. But what if we changed the way we thought about it and said, and we repented and we said, God, forgive us. And I'm going to spend my evenings spending time with you. I'm going to spend my evenings just hanging out with my family. I'm going to pray with my kids or my grandkids, or I'm going to pray for my kids or my grandkids before I go to sleep. What if we spend our time meditating and dwelling on the Word of God for our lives? What if we spend our time praying for those that have hurt us throughout the day? What if we spent our time actually doing what the Bible tells us to do? What if we repented and changed the way we think? And he says, repent. Remember how far you've fallen. Repent. Or stop it. And do the works you did at first. It's it's, it's a simple formula. And I hate to use the word formula with God because there is no such thing as a formula with God. But repent. Remember. Repent. And do those first works. Remember. Repent. And do those first works. And I believe, this is what I believe. I believe that if we will remember where we came from, God is going to ignite in us fire. God is going to ignite in us a passion. God is going to ignite in us the very thing we need to see this city and this county and this region and this nation transformed with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with the power, the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead now dwells in you and quickens your mortal body. But we've got to get back to the place of first love. We've got to get back to the place where seeking his face and seeking his feet is the, is the sole motivation of our life. We've got to get back there. We must find our way back there. If we do not find our way back there, I'm fearful of where we'll end up. Because we could go for another revival. America needs a revival. America needs an awakening. America needs the blood-bought saints of God to get serious about this thing. 
That's what America needs. That's what Governor New York needs. Governor New York does not need another church with the great sing- with with loud music and singing modern songs. Governor New York does not need another church that sings hymns and is quiet. Governor New York does not need another church. Governor New York needs the blood-bought saints of Christ to get serious about doing the work of Jesus. The governor of New York needs the blood-bought saints of Christ to stand up and say, enough is enough. I am sick and tired of seeing my children walk off and go to and, and walk into a devil's hell. I am sick and tired of watching my grandchildren and my best friend's children. I am sick and tired of watching them die of disease. I am sick and tired of watching them die to drugs. I am sick and tired of watching them walk away from God because the church is powerless to do anything about it because the church gave up her right when she gave up being on her knees. And if we are going to see everything that we are praying for, if we are going to see this church and the churches in this region become a lighthouse for the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we are going to have to get serious about finding the feet of Jesus. We are going to have to get serious about restoring our first love. Remember how far you have fallen. Oh, do you feel that? Holy Spirit, love. Remember how far you have fallen. Repent. God, I repent. God, I pray that you forgive me for putting the things of the world at more value than you. God, I repent. God, forgive me. Forgive me for not seeking you. God, forgive me God, help me to find your feet again. God, we need your feet. Jesus, Jesus. God, let us find your feet again. Let us find your feet again, God. Come on, saints of God. Let's begin to pray. Jesus. Maybe you are in this place this morning. And you say, I I don't know, I can't return to a first love because I've never fallen in love. Maybe I can't return to a first love because I've never accepted him as my savior. If that is you, 
I would invite you, come. And let us pray. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning in this place, come. Oh, Jesus. God, I ask right now. Come on, pray with me, church. You ain't got to listen to me pray. This isn't the Sean show. Pray with me. God, I ask right now that you release grace for personal devotion and prayer at home. God, I just ask right now, Father God, that you release grace in this house, Father God, to burn in our private time more than we burn together, Father God, to lay down the mask and lay down the facade and just come to you as we are, Father God, not as you would have us be, but God, as we are, flaws and all. God, I just pray right now, I release grace in this house. Father God, oh, I release grace in this house for personal private devotion. I release, I release. Mountains are still being moved. Strongholds are still being loosed. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. Because bodies are still being raised. Giants are still being slain. God, we believe. Yes, we can see it. Wonders are still what you do. Because we are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here. Come and do 